as an introduction, I want to start with the word sustainability. It's an important word, and it's a ubiquitous word. However, it's just this ubiquity that has arguably rendered this word open to co-optation, perhaps especially when used in conjunction with corporate entities whose primary interests and activities might be seen as the very antithesis of that which this word suggests. The urgency of attention to the sustainable might, on the contrary, be imagined as immune to such venal attempts at greenwashing when encountered in relation to our academic, often humanistic realms. The University of Bergen, which is where I work, for example, uh, there, sustainability has been made one of the institution's uh, strategic research areas, and faculty are encouraged to highlight such concerns in their funding applications, often to funding bodies who have likewise prioritized just these areas. But looking past this benevolent embrace of sustain the sustainable, we become aware of the fact that this word has indeed become exploited in academic institutions for its illocutionary force, perhaps no more innocent of virtue signaling than its use by corporate entities, used mainly as a means for garnering more capital for the university's coffers. The word attached to nature, very often evident in the not at all random image on the University of Bergen's website, may function as a sort of comforting and non-confrontational way of erecting a socially responsible veneer without looking at some of the more complex and discomforting issues that a deep understanding of and commitment to sustainability might entail. So let me make, as a way of expounding upon this, a short detour here and gauge and engage another word often co-opted by administered universities in service of veneer construction, and oops, that is the word diversity. It is just this word that Philip Ewell has highlighted in his important and unfortunately what turned out to be controversial article on music theory and the white racial frame. Ewell argues that diversity embraced by academic institutions and departments offers an anodyne, non-controversial, non-confrontational means for appearing to support inclusivity and equality in academic realms while concurrently allowing those in power to avoid having to confront and admit complicity with those structures that must be understood as disquietingly racist, the word that makes everybody uncomfortable. Without such admissions and realizations, Ewell argues, the depth of this white racial frame that structures fields such as music theory can never be adequately combated. So what might a common sense, one-dimensional understanding of sustainability be hiding? First, in line with de Scola's theorizations, as he says, this Western invention of nature, the creation of a sphere of plants, trees, waterways, as this thing that is somehow apart from, for example, culture, human beings, ideology, etc. Sustainability's reduction to nature allows nature to function in the same manner as diversity, keeping from view the myriad troubling things that mark our academic ecosystems. Here, students and faculty grinding away, overworked, overstressed, in service of the perpetuation of a system that exploits, that compels endless commodified production of research artifacts, of funding proposals, of discipline-bound doctoral degree, degrees, which are, according to Menand, a fetish of academic culture. We churn out more product than can ever be consumed, while Elsevier charges literally millions for access to materials we will never have the time to read, bound, as Kevin Corson argues, to an academic realm, 
marked by, quote, a corporate mentality that builds a certain planned obsolescence into scholarship through an exaggerated reverence for scholarly currency, unquote. But beyond this self-constructed us, there is an entire word, world out there that is impacted upon by this capitalist machine, and the effects are far more deadly, literally deadly in many cases, than those with which many of us, as relatively privileged people, are faced. Because in my estimation, the humanities themselves are not sustainable. Not because they are under the threat of the mighty STEM, which of course they are, but because the very project of the humanities, the ongoing project of the global north, are unsustainable at the level of epistemology and ethics. These realizations have been catalysts for this long process of writing the book about which I'm going to speak. It is a book, as I said, written from a space of anger, indeed fury, that is unapologetically polemical, understanding the requisiteness of both emotion and rhetorical stance in relation to a desire for social change, as with the ACT UP activists in the early days of the AIDS crisis. To quote Audre Lorde, when we turn from anger, we turn from insight, saying we will only accept the designs that we know. So looking at the two humanities disciplines in which most of my academic life has been lived, ethnomusicology and queer or gender studies, uh, has spurned uh, and spurned on by decolonial scholarship, it became obvious to me that far from bastions of equality and equity, that these disciplines themselves are implicated in some of the most nefarious of colonialist extractivist pro projects. These realizations have been co coalescing around ethnomusicology for years, resulting, for example, in a scathing necessary open letter to the Society for Ethnomusicology by scholar Danielle Brown, a woman of color who unapologetically highlighted the discipline, discipline's racism. They led to my refusal of the self-definition as an ethnomusicologist and the publication of my article in the Journal of Musicology calling for an end to what I view as a colonialist practice. However, it was the meeting of the ethno and the queer in academia, a meeting of synchronicity, one greeted by many as an example of our always inclusive ethical scholarship that seemed troubling to me rather than any cause for celebration. And exploring these dynamics via the metaphoric and material complexities of sound and silence is central to my current book, Ethnomusicology, Queerness, Masculinity, Silence Equals Death. This is a book about not only silencing sex and sexualities, but Western academia's vicious monologic silencing in general, emanating from the very sites where other voices are purported to be represented, and about how such silencings have been foundational to our epistemological and various disciplinary pedagogical projects for centuries. Indeed, the astounding ease with which one of the most egregious examples of colonialist scholarship, ethnomusicology, has dovetailed with a theoretical political stance, queerness, that is self-constructed as standing in diametric opposition to just such exploitations, and the lack of total lack of critical attention that has greeted such a meeting signals a need to examine these instances of symbiotic unions as indicative of disturbing undercurrents at disciplinary, institutional, and pervasive socio- and geocultural levels. Ethnomusicology, for the vast majority of its existence, has been marked by a deafening silencing and infuriating pre present absence of any attention to same-sex desire 
an obliteration often explained away as some sort of ethical, cross-culturally sensitive refusal to impose Western epistemologies or ontologies, for example, homosexuality, onto non-Western sites and practices. Yet, the very moment that non-normative sexualities are embraced by the ethnomusicological canon of vetted as safe theoretical foci, it is in fact what is, I argue, the most Western, the most provincial concept and construction of sexuality conceivable, queerness. This queerness is inextricable from and gestated in relationship to capitalism, post-structuralism, and post-modernism, an anglophone, Eurocentric, hegemonic monologue that perpetually endeavors to conceal just this genesis. And these largely unacknowledged, actively obscured foundations linked in disturbing manners to gendered, racist, and colonialist power structures which ultimately anima animate both disciplinary sites cannot but further uh, perpetuate further exploitations. Taking as a catalyst Foucault's The Order of Things and his formation of the uh, formulation of the concept of the episteme, cultural historical periods in which what he calls rules of formation legitimize only certain forms of knowledge. My overarching argument in the book is that there remains a centuries-long meta-episteme animated and perpetuated by an enduring and thus far unassailable culturally specific constructions of masculinity. Drawing additionally upon Roderick Ferguson's The Reorder of Things, I argue that this masculine meta-epistemic structuring limits not only what can be known, but how it can be known, for whom various ways of knowing are judged as valid or invalid, and crucially, how epistemic formations occur not only within a putatively sequestered Western context, as Foucault de facto suggests, but in relation to an ideologically, discursively, and materially exploitive relationship to various others the West has constructed. This specific gendering is, as Kremen, Mignolo, Lugones, Nzegwu, and countless others have argued, indissolubly linked to a rapacious, capitalist-driven colonizing impulse that marks the West's relationship to countless other geocultural sites, including within Western academia. It is a relationship founded upon an extractivist obsession, taking raw materials from other sites, populated by those constructed as not yet or never to be human, fashioning them and their cultural productions into profitable commodities. I'd like to offer here a brief partial overview of how this masculine meta-episteme manifests in the two disciplines I have scrutinized and there's some images of this relationship of the colonialist to this masculinist impulse. The two, again, uh, are sort of indissolubly linked. So first, and perhaps most obviously, although inconceivably never discussed or theorized, Understanding the construction of music as feminine in Western culture, ethnomusicologists have used the discipline's relationship to anthropology and fieldwork as sites for the construction of a masculine identity of the practitioner and subject position. Here, Susan Sontag's anthropologist as hero, a man marked by scientific objectivity, is apropos. The field worker is an intrepid explorer and colonist, with technology also implicated in the ultimate production of visual and textual control, supported by and supporting an entirely asymmetrical power relationship wherein so-called visibility or representation of diversity 
are related to a concurrently homophobic and homophilic relationship that is unspeakable. This results in the invisibilization of all non-normative, but especially homosexual, sexualities. Second, embodied and sexual desire is likewise obliterated, a lacuna in both ethnomusicology and queer studies. This related to an obvious, unspeakable terror and suspicion of the complexities of corporeal, sexual, sensual, material existence and the fleshly body, a body that must be vanquished constantly via recourse to the theoretical and discursive in order to comport with the types of objective masculinist inquiry that capital-driven academia deems valuable and essential. This obliteration of embodied sexual and sensual experience has been noted decades ago by scholars such as Bersani and Reed Farr, and more recently by Ashtor and Wong. Third, this erotophobia, as I call it, is manifest in the over-reliance on a perpetually reproduced yet unacknowledged canon of capital T theory, a type of theory almost wholly Western and Anglophone that is itself, as persuasively argued by Lutz, coded as masculine and superior. And the production of the citation-based textual artifacts marked by the imprimatur of the masculine via the support of intellectual and monetary capital perpetuates the circuits of compelled production commodification, and consumption within the proper academic, largely Western slash Northern, journals and presses. This is concurrent with a denial of the extent to which others, largely those of color, largely outside the West's sanctuary, have been exploited, dehumanized, and silenced in these processes. And finally, and most centrally, a wholesale silencing of certain subjects is central to the colonialist capitalist project. Subjects as sites of knowledge, for example, sex and sexuality outside the West's own definitions, and subjects as people reduced to their representations. Both are banished to sites of, at best, marginalization, as Roderick Ferguson has argued, and thus administrative, epistemic, and material containment. What this has ultimately led to is the monologue of the Western meta-episteme encompassing what is known, how it is known, and who judges the validity of both. Ethnomusicology, via its textual artifacts and, present and performances, congratulates itself for representing diversities. It invents and represents its colonies, speaking for the populations inhabiting them, explaining their thoughts, motivations, comprehensions, cosmologies, in an objective language that may be wholly unsuited for giving voice to this otherness of Western construction that contemporary texts are frequently notable for their quotations from actual natives, that the word informant has generally been replaced by the terms such as consultant, does little to disguise the monologic characteristics of an enterprise devoted to the perpetual recreation of the masculinity of its practitioners and the obvious stifling masculinity of the space operating via tools the weapons of this masculinity. It is moreover a practice in which it is the illocutionary force of tens of thousands of texts taken individually and together as suggested by Sylvia Winter's deciphering practice that has the ultimate and primary goal of conferring or withholding the status of human to those mined and exploited as natural resources. And while queerness might be imagined as tasked with the unmasking of just such practices and productions, it is clear as evidenced by this comfortable 
interdisciplinary fit of the ethno and the queer that the sites of overlap are not inconsequential, owing in part to the operation of both in relation to the same epistemic limitations and compulsions. Numerous foundational aspects of the way academic queerness operates, as distinct from what it says, appear indeed to be far from confrontational or subversive. Both ethnomusicological and queer scholarship are overwhelmingly marked by their adherence to the very methodologies, epistemologies, sensorial hierarchies, rhetorical strategies, and fetishized artifacts that are the constructions of centuries of closed doors, dispossessions, and exploitations. The rules structuring this academic game as it is still played are those which have been reproduced over the course of centuries within locations that allowed for the very existence of only one species of speaking subject, self-appointed and self-anointed as superior and fully human by dint of his, indeed his, sex, gender, and race. Such rules, such practices are today still redolent, as Walter Maniolo says in his book on decolonial scholarship, still redolent of the different aromas of 500 years of Western epistemic racism. As Kenyan, sorry, as Kenyan scholar Kaguro Macharia highlights, reading through US-produced works circulating as queer African studies, one is confronted by its, quote, indifference to many of the conceptual frames in African studies, unquote, so that it is, as he says again, quote, difficult to imagine that African philosophers have ever written anything that conceptualizes personhood, individuality, or community, unquote. He further argues that, quote, queer African voices and experiences in Western queer theory are absorbed as data or evidence, but not as modes of theory or as challenges to the conceptuals, conceptual assumptions of queer studies, unquote. Although numerous eminent scholars, such as Butler, Eng, Halberstam, Munoz, Poir, and Warner repeatedly claimed over the course of decades in elite publications that, for example, quote, the reinvention of queer is contingent upon its potential obsolescence, that queer might have to be yielded in favor of terms that do political work more effectively, or that in the new world order, we should be more than, unusual, more than usually cautious about global utopianisms that require American slang. Four decades on from the inception of the supposedly inclusive moniker that needed to be thrown away, that needed to be disposable, nowhere does it appear to be a burning desire to dethrone queer. To the contrary, it has become complicit in silencing other non-normative, experiential, sensual, sexual knowledges comfortably ensconced within the administrative, disciplinary, economic structures of the university, no less extractivist than colonialist ethnomusicology. This adherence is supported by what is an unacknowledged but foundational belief in, as Linda to Highway Smith notes, the West's own self-construction as the, quote, center of legitimate knowledge, the ob arbiter of what counts as knowledge. Uh, counts as, uh, sorry, uh, the arbiter of what counts as knowledge and the source of civilized knowledge. It is a knowledge presented as seminal, original, and generative, each new supposedly, supposedly new discovery the first of its kind, often denying any sort of indigenous contributions, a knowledge that is universal, supposedly, yet owned, and as she says, as much a commodity of colonial exploitation as other natural resources. 
From this location, what masquerades as move towards, moves towards equity more often appear to be motivated, motivated by an implicit desire to bring a constructed backwards them into our forward intellectual economic institutions, educating them on the universal proper rules of knowledge production and theorization. As Kulpa, Mizilenska, and Stasinska have argued just these points. There is no move towards an us that can obtain only via the arduous, always ongoing work of dialogic, heteroglossic interaction and transformation. Although the Western academic subject has widened the visual scope to embrace new objects and subjects, the manner of speaking and writing and representing the use of what Morrison calls oppressive language, whether the proud but calcified language of the academy or the commodity-driven language of silence, belies loyalty to long-standing structures of inequity. The resulting stifling monologic stream, according to Toni Morrison, does more than represent violence, it is violence. It does more than represent the limits of knowledge, it limits knowledge. Such violence defined, sorry, such violence defined by appropriately discomforting terms as, sorry, uh, as Sousa Santos's ep epistemicide and Rabaka's epistemic apartheid, both arguably related to Mbebe's concept of necropolitics, continues to have profound consequences, not least of which is the unconscionable absence of people of color, of minorities of all sorts, of scholars, researchers, artists, and activists from non-Western countries from little more than what people have often noted as token representation in relation to actual positions of power within both ethnomusicology and queer studies and the Western Academy as a whole. So I wanted to suggest that we have much to gain from thinking about these equity inequities in relationship to the sonic perhaps in relation to Bakhtin's concept of the dialogic and heteroglossic with Nancy's writing on listening and resonance or resonance, as I think of it. Embracing these concepts and the sonic as metaphoric and a reminder of the audibility and materiality of speech, its vibrational qualities, leads to a conceptualization and possible actualization of equitable epistemic futures without monologic suzerainty, without interdisciplinarity, because without discipline. A future imagined through affects as an echo. In many ways, our Western theories and representations do operate as echo in the current marketplace of ideas, indeed a marketplace where prominence and preeminence is guaranteed by the capital back circuits of the West. But the echoing that we now have is that of a fallow echo chamber into which our epistemic injustice has pulled others, its blaring loudspeakers, hence the images on the cover of my book, violently drowning out all other concepts, subjects, interlocutors. Sound here ricochets and eradicates, overwhelms as but another colonialist weapon. There are, however, I think and I hope, ways out of the chamber, other echoing possibilities. Sorry. Engendered by the metaphoric, conceptual, and experiential meeting of the auditory and the affective both of which confound linguistic, linguistic and subjective control, and the wild, this last term used in the sense suggested by Jack Halberstam. 
the wild as a wide open space of multiplicity and possibility. The possibilities of a dialogic resonance, a mutually constituting echoing, confound the assault of the monologic. While conceiving of a dispersal into the open, in general terms, might appear to highlight both queernesses and ethnomusicology's colonial ambitions, a return to the auditory once again offers different possibilities. The openness of an exterior, expansive, unconstrained space in which sound can never be fully controlled, cannot but dissipate or animate, must meet other motile, vibrating, human, non-human forces, contrasts starkly with this closed echo chamber, the indoor finite space that contains, restrains, and deadens vibrational possibilities. Released into the wild of epistemic possibility of the pluriversal, defined by Mbebe as, sorry, the, the process of knowledge production that does not necessarily abandon the notion of universal knowledge for humanity, but which embraces it via a horizontal strategy of openness to dialogue among many different epistemic positions, the disciplinary instruments of control withdrawn, our monologic disciplines might echo in any number of ways that cannot be counted upon in advance. Any of our provisional, once all-encompassing concepts will be but one voice in the pluriversal soundscape, no longer the lone, droning, deafening, fundamental tone. Highlighting this materiality of sound allows for a feeling of a self as a mutually constituting and constitutive component of a literally vibrating, sonorous, silent expanse that encompasses the, encompasses the immediate and the horizontal or horizontal. Embracing the mutually vibrational persuades us to abjure claims of self-sufficiency, of finitude, of essence, and primacy. The multimodal, comprehending, experiencing of complex sonic relationships can reveal the limits and insufficiencies of the narrow, disembodied understandings of language begetting monologic, colonizing concepts disseminated via an artificial, stifling system of discipline and disciplines. We may ultimately understand that a textual obliteration of the materialities, sensualities, and aesthetics of sex, body, sound, music is not the apogee of human intellectual possibility, but yet another effect of disciplining, masculinizing power knowledge. Thinking and feeling sonically, in short, contributes to a movement towards the fruitfulness of multiplicity. Related to the foregoing and looking out to new modes of research, learning, and pedagogies, I note Sousa Santos's argument that it is the artist who will be responsible for and indispensable in leading out of the West's epistemic monopoly its abyssal thinking. Embracing the creative and aesthetic must surely expose the folly of our mania for objective and critical, the primacy given to supposedly disembodied mind by foregrounding the experiential knowledges brought forth by this beautifully complex and multivalent human sensorium that we all have. And admitting to the power of the sensual supports the need for a commitment to embracing the status of sound as a vibrational, essential part of ecological materiality, a materiality that suggests a being together, a place in which interlocutors see, indeed smell, and often touch one another. And these are not tangential, 
epiphenomenal disposable accoutrements to the supposedly real work of written texts, discourse, and the realm of the ideological. And I'm very close to finishing. Candace Chu argues persuasively that our current humanities, of which I have used ethnomusicology and queer studies as I believe apt examples, are not worth defending because, to quote her, the history of the humanities and the disciplinary structures organizing their emergence is of a piece with the history of the civilizational discourses subtending the, leg the legitimation of empire and capital and bespeaks the onto-epistemologies that have come to secure liberal modernity's common sense. She argues to the contrary for what she calls an illiter illiberal humanities, that in contradistinction to our supposedly liberal humanities, are directed towards the protection and flourishing of people and ways of being and knowing and inhabiting the planet that liberal humanism wrought through the defining structures of modernity, and I would say masculinity, indissolubly linked to this creation of modernity, try so hard to dis extinguish. Such a move would engender nothing less than the emancipation of the human from liberalism's grasp. To sustain, to repair, or to demolish our current humanities, our ethnomusicologies, our queer studies. I believe that the time is long overdue for each of us to have even asked such questions. And if asked, I hope that the answers will not be guided by fear, self-interest, or inertia that comes from financial, disciplinary, or administrative pressures, but rather from feelings of not only anger and fury, but also from hope and generosity and the commitment to working towards an infinitely more equitable and vaster sustainable ecosystem, one in which the resonance of dialogue is an always vibrating, constitutive, and ever changing catalyst. Thank you. Stephen, I have a question about yeah. queer as a nomenclature and classification. And this goes back to a conversation we had yesterday, but also ties into the lecture that you just gave a presentation on. And so for me as a queer folklorist, I use it as a catch-all term because we have an alphabet soup now where it's not just LGBTQ, it's now LGBTQ+, plus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it becomes a mouthful after a while. But moving forward with uh, queer studies and queer folkloristics, et cetera, like what would you suggest we would call it moving forward? Um, thank you. Um, I first of all want to say that I didn't necessarily make queer in this, uh, make queer, make clear uh, in this, yeah, make, I think, yeah. Uh, th that I didn't necessarily make clear in the presentation, but I do in the book, that I have absolutely no argument or problem uh, with anyone's use of this term if it is something that gives them solace, if it, if, if it consolidates something that helps them feel an identity. And I also don't have so much of a problem with it uh, in political ways or uh, quotidian ways. Uh, what I have a problem with is this academic uh, embrace of it, where it has become uh, like uh, Teresa de Loretis, uh, who is uh, uh, known as the person who originated this term in one of her conferences decades ago, where she even said it has become this vapid creation of the publishing industry. And I don't know what replaces it except for maybe this constantly revolving thing where people actively, scholars, I mean, it might sound crazy, but scholars actively say, I'm not using this term anymore, I'm using another term. 
And if some people do it, then maybe this contributes to the, um, the pluriversality. I, I can give you an anecdote of um, when I published my first book, um, and the subtitle was, uh, God, what was the subtitle? Harry, you just told me. Uh, Rolo uh, uh Russian popular music, and post-Soviet homosexuality. And the publisher was arguing that I needed to say queerness because it would sell more books. But the word queerness in Moscow and St. Petersburg in the time in which I was doing my field work was not something that was widely used, was not something that had a resonance for most of the men I was talking to. Um, and indeed, they identified as homosexual. Right. And so I don't have a good answer, but I also feel like for younger scholars, I wouldn't say that you should necessarily um, disable yourself by refusing to do things. I think it's really incumbent upon people like older scholars who have jobs and somewhat security to sort of raise up their voices and say things. Um, although then we're sort of uh, criticized, well, you're old, you don't get it anymore, you don't know what, what these things are. But I think Maybe all of us have a duty in some way. I mean, maybe even at the least to have a conference called Displacing Queer would be something to think about. Um, who wants to join? Uh, yeah. Does that answer the question? I do have one quick follow-up question yeah, yeah. about that. So, I mean, by using these terminologies such as queer or LGBTQ+, et cetera, I mean, that's cultural vocabulary being used within the global north, particularly within Western civilization. So how do we identify uh, people who are residing outside the global north or Western society? Because I mean, the example you gave with gay men living in St. Petersburg, I mean, they don't want to be called queer. They want to be known as homosexuals. So should we just be following the lead of the people who we are profiling? Or what would you suggest? See, I, I, I forget, maybe it was when I was speaking with Bev, or I can't remember. You can raise your hand if it was someone else. Um, I, when I, yeah, it was Bev. When I was at, uh, I, I went to a couple of online conferences during uh, COVID, and um, I was really depressed at how many times people were saying, um, uh, you know, they were looking at an indigenous practice and saying, this is an example of genderqueer. And I thought, why does it have to be an example of our nomenclature? Why wouldn't the reverse be true? Why couldn't queer be a subset of something else? Because so many people that I have read now um, sort of look at this idea, uh, these decolonial scholars in particular, uh, talk about the fact that um, we don't admit to the fact that these concepts, that we do have literally the money to, to disseminate throughout the world and then demand that people speak English to read the journals, uh, for God's sakes, that, um, God, what was I saying? Oh, that, that queerness, as I said, and I know this makes people angry and I've gotten pushback, but you know, queerness for me, as I said, is this incredibly provincial uh, concept. It's not universal, it's not unmarked, it comes from some place. And I think it's time to, to, that we have to admit these things. I mean, I almost feel like we should just, you know, ask people from different corners of the world, what term would you like us to use? And then, like, we could vote on it and, and, and say, for the next three years, uh, we're only going to use this term. But it, like as Butler and Eng and Halberstam are saying, no, it's temporary. No, it's going to be overthrown. No, queerness is against solidification. Here we are, for 40 years later, still using the same term. And I, I think we should like, you know, put it up for a vote and like an online vote, who's in the chat room? And, and, liter <laughs> and literally say, we will, 
I mean, maybe it sounds crazy, but why? I mean, it's no crazier than how this system works now and say, it can, we can only use it for two years, and then we're going to choose another term, and then someone else will be radical enough to say, who can you say that we can only, who are you to say we can only use it for two? And then there will be a discussion about these things. Um, so yeah, God, I get worked up. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, John. So apologies if this doesn't come out as smooth as I'd like it to. Um, but first, I just want to like, uh, just I admire deeply your anger and your um, just the, um, what's the word for it? Your unapologetic kind of attitude towards polemic. Um, I think being a grad student in Ethno is, uh, especially as a dyke, <laughs> it's really interesting in that I find that anger is something that, I'm not saying it's necessarily just ethno, but in the academy in general, anger and dyke anger and gay anger is something that is, like you said, with um, masculine theory with a capital T, it's something that is encouraged in a very liberal sense that you have to contain and put in a box. And so my question is actually more so looking for advice mm -hmm. in, in that how do you carry that anger and that desire to disturb because the academy needs to be disturbed while also trying to fit into an academy that actively is trying to masculinize um, and trying to snuff out that anger. Um, so for me, I know with my major research paper, it is deeply polemical, very angry, very confrontational, but it's really hard to do that in a academy that is actively trying to masculinize my work because that is what will be accepted to journals yeah. um, and presentations. So basically just wondering how do, you, how do you continue stoking that fire in a setting that wants to actively snuff it out? Well, first of all, I just want to, a couple of suggestions for reading. Have you read Audre Lorde's The Uses of Anger? Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful essay. I highly recommend it. And I, I think uh, the, 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 the fact that you said specifically dyke anger makes me want to uh, suggest that um, you read um, uh, Sarah Ahmed's work. And she talks about the affect alien, where uh, we are afraid to be the affect alien when everyone says, oh, this is so good. This is so wonderful. You know, this works beautifully. And then you're, you're feeling like, no, this isn't great. And she gives the example of what people have termed the, the killjoy lesbian, uh, where you're supposed to, you know, that people say, oh, she's just an angry dyke, and that's why she doesn't get how good it is, and that people sort of get sucked in to, to going along with the, with the program, even though they feel furious. I would say that your anger can be part of your work. That, you know, in terms of, because I try to be hopeful as well. Um, and that, that you can have other voices. Maybe you will have some pushback, but maybe you could produce different kinds of, of scholarship that comports with the complexity that all of us have, the different facets that all of us have. And I think also it could be fantastic to align with other people who feel the same way and to do something, to do like an online conference where you don't need a lot of money to do it, to get a bunch of angry dykes together and say, seriously, angry dyke conference, you know, where People can get together and you can encourage them to say, we don't want you to give conference papers, we want you to give subject positions. We don't care if you give uh, a long poem. Uh, we would like to intersperse, if you're comfortable with academic writing, um, that's great. If you would rather do a, an essay, if you want to co-write something, if you would like to have a dialogue, and literally do these things, and this becomes part of your work as well. So that maybe then, see, I, I'm really not saying that citation-based work 
that uses specific authors is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. The West, the West, you know, as the Renaissance on modernity, has done many great things. But when it becomes the only thing, when it is, as uh, Sylvia Winter has argued, when the West has created what is literally human as only the reflection of itself, then this becomes the problem. And I think if we could all be a little bit more generous, a little bit more creative, um, and I really encourage you to like think about doing things like this. I mean, everyone, myself, I should be doing these things. Um, that then the more they are seen, the more people uh, are exposed to scholarship that is smart and engaged and deep and irreverent that your voice that now might seem lone in the wilderness can really become foundational to changing this unsustainable ecosystem. It's a long slog. I mean, I don't think there's any uh, easy answers, but there's no easy answers to sexism or racism or genocide or any of these things uh, that seem to continue. Um, helpful at all? It was brilliant. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, I <laughs> wanted to ask about, you talked about art and aesthetics as like a way forward yep. through this. I was wondering if you have anything to say about like the privilege of making art in the world that we do now where like it doesn't value art, it values capital and it values production. But like where does that privilege exist if we're trying to focus in an aesthetic way forward? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I would say that in terms of aesthetics, I, I do sort of think of aesthetics in, I guess, the, the work-a-day way where it's about things like beauty or uh, relationships. But I think about aesthetics as, in, terms, in, related, in relation to the term aesthesis, where it's about that which is greeted by the entire human sensorium. So it's not about, oh, what a beautiful painting. Although it can be about, oh, what a beautiful painting. But I, I'm uh, talking about aesthetics as a way of really highlighting the fact that we are these complex, we have these complex sensorial bodies in which we live. Um, I don't know that I have a way of addressing that, although there are scholars who are working, um, I'm just thinking right now of this Russian artist slash writer, Yevgeny Fix, who has done work on not only uh, Argots of uh, gay Russian men in Stalinist Russia, uh, where there was this whole sort of um, dictionary of, of gay slang and gay terms. And he uh, put them on penance and hung them in the gallery and wrote a book along with it. Uh, so these are ways where he's not necessarily capital-backed, although he did get funding probably. But I think there's a lot of artists these days uh, who do work more with in community settings rather than uh, work trying to get gallery showings. But Am I getting towards your question? Um, or maybe you might want to focus me again by asking? I think I just want to like, I want it to be talked about more that to make art is a privilege. And you mentioned like slightly earlier that older professors, older people, or like yeah. more established people in academic spaces have a responsibility to sort of talk about that. Yeah. But there's a lot of privilege of being that person. There's a lot of struggle with it also, like yeah. the workload and the lack of balance. But I don't know, it's just like, disheartening to be a young person who wants to make art, who wants to say things, and then doesn't find comfortable valleys to do it in, I think. And I, I don't know, I just wanted to think, I was just thinking about it, so I was brought up. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think the art world, I mean, oh God, what was I just watching uh, on, oh good Lord, that's my phone now. <laughs> the worst audience member interrupting his own talk. Um, okay. Um, well, the art world, I mean, obviously is this prime example of this filthy, 
uh, filthy lucre driven, what is that, filthy lucre? Uh, driven uh, ecosystem that is really horrible. But I don't have really any, I haven't thought about it as much uh, as maybe I could have. But as Susa Santos says, the post abyssal artist is going to be instrumental in looking towards this abyss that the, the West cannot look past. And I think this sort of artist, um, and actually let me then pick up on something. Um, you know, there is this idea that people have been looking at, uh, even in the realm of psychology, of distributed creativity. I think all of us, you know, if you look at re renewable resources, the one resource that is profoundly renewable is creativity. Human beings are creative. And maybe, again, like um, if we foster, or again, another conference where we say, you, you know, mix creativity in some other way with your written work, and let's tackle these important issues that are facing us, bring something that is coming from like expressive culture with you. I mean, these are all important things. You know, the, the problem is that to make a conference, well, even to have me here, it takes so much money, you know? And that's why, as I said to Bev today, you know, I loved COVID for one thing, that you could have a conference for almost zero dollars, zero euros. And I told her also that, you know, this was the first time in my entire academic career where I looked at the little pictures and there were so many young people, people of color, people that I generally didn't see at the in-person uh, conferences because they couldn't afford to go. I mean, you can't afford to go unless you have like research money. And this Zoom ain't great in many ways, but let's think about what we can do in terms of making things more equitable. Thinking about an online graduate seminar where people from different countries can join in, you know, this is, and where we encourage creative works so that, here's, here's my closing thing, so that this term artist isn't a subset of person, that we can all sort of value our creativity and that some people might be, might make work that speaks to more people, but it isn't driven by capital so much. I know this is sort of idealistic, but again, I would say, as I said about the Dyke Anger thing, this is, these are processes and, it, and it's gonna, and it takes a lot of work to change things. And it might not even happen in my lifetime. I see we have a uh, question from someone in the chat room. Right, so not from me, but from one of our students who is joining us online, Ulysses. So, following the statement, decolonization is not a metaphor, is there a way of decolonizing academia in factual terms, considering the colonial lineage of institutions? Um, well, talk about the long, arduous work that is gonna take a long time. And uh, I believe this person is uh, quoting, actually, I forget the author, but it's someone that I quote in the book. Yeah, and I actually have to say that I was a little bit, um, yeah, I feel like, well, let, yeah, back, back, back. Um, I feel in some ways that I'm not the person who should be leading this discussion because I am, you know, in many ways by dint of my race, part of the problem. I mean, in some ways I am a minority and, and a person who has been uh, marginalized. I mean, I was talking with someone yesterday that when I did research for the book, I think it was John, and searched so many databases, I found that up until something like 2010, there were only six monographs in ethnomusicology that had anything to do with non-normative sexuality. Six. I mean, this is insane. So in some ways I have been invisibilized, but also in terms of decolonization, 
I mean, I am a colonizer. I mean, that is the reality of the thing, of the situation. Um, I don't have an easy answer for this. Uh, institutions, this institution exists on lands uh, that were taken from native populations. Um, in Norway, there were, where I live, there are dispossessions and there are histories of dispossessions. I hope that by having a position of some sort of power, although, you know, I'm just an associate professor at some university, but my book is, by the way, um, open access. I uh, demanded that it had to be open access and I got funding for it, capitalist system, but anyone can download the book. It's free, just uh, Google the title and you'll find the publisher's page. And maybe by, and I do say this in the book, I'm hoping to encourage other people to speak up. And I would love to have my voice silenced and allow other people to speak up who have more first-hand experiences and who will deal with, I do believe that it is important to engage the metaphoric and the material. And I do believe that it's important to think of these things sonically, but I understand and I really would never argue against people arguing with me saying, there's a time and a place for everything, so we need to deal with the real consequences of these things. But in terms of what we can do, I don't think it will be an overnight thing that we will be able to fix these things. I believe it will take generosity of the older people in, in the faculties of arguing for initiatives that want to de-seat uh, some of the most problematic things uh, of putting our necks on the line a little bit um, because we have been given things that other people haven't been given and supporting uh, other viewpoints and thinking of ways that we can support our younger students to take on initiatives that would be beneficial for them, beneficial for other people, and beneficial for the struggles against this sort of thing. I am, yeah, I hope that's an answer, at least in part. Uh, I have a question that concerns how limiting the English language is for some of the issues that we need to discuss. But in keeping with that, I also wanted to mention, and this might be useful to some of the people who've asked questions, that the International Council for Traditional Music started last year to run uh, something they called dialogues, and there were 27 of them. They were organized all over the world by people who spoke many different languages and, and had many points of view, and they would usually have maybe three people who would introduce a particular topic, and then it would be more open for discussion. But it was, it, it opened up academic discussions in ways that I think conferences in the Western world are not doing because these were organized in so many different parts of the world. So uh, I'm, they're doing it again this year, I think, so it might be interesting to look into that. But the question was, I'm, I'm always struck by the English language. My indigenous friends always see it as a pragmatic language, but one that really has no, um, it, it's not feeling full, uh, it's yeah. not, you know, there, there's all sorts of limitations to the language itself. And I wondered if there are ways of discussing the important issues that you're raising here that are done better in other languages. Let, let, let me make sure I understood the last part of that, uh, the last part of that question. If there's, can you, can you repeat that? Because I wasn't quite sure what well, the question was. I, I guess I'm really interested in, in how the English language is perhaps confining discussions of gender and sexuality. Um, uh, well, we could leave it at that, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, and thank you very much for that example, which I didn't know about, but this is exactly the sort of thing um, that I think is really important. And, and you know, I painted with a broad brush here, 
an unfairly broad brush, I think, also. And I should note, and I probably should have been much more explicit about this in the book, but it's too late for that. You know, I'm coming, although I did note that, you know, I'm coming from uh, most, yeah, the vast majority of my working life in the United States and Northern Europe, and specifically looking at the power of SEM. Um, because I think SEM in many ways is this really, really problematic institution. And, and this is after absolutely, you know, again, as a, as a white man, um, I thought, well, maybe I'm just being white savior bringing these issues. But I was cognizant of the fact that when Daniel Brown wrote this letter as a woman of color, that so many people of color and so many younger people really chimed in and said, Yet, you know, that no, today's ethnomusicology is not a welcoming place. Thank you very much. And they were agreeing with that. And there are all sorts of initiatives. I can even say that the vibe here uh, in this university is so much different than the ethno vibe in many of the places that I studied and worked. And I think this is sort of a hopeful place here um, for me. Um, this question of English um, and English not being amenable uh, to exploring the total possibilities. I would suggest, have you ever read Toril Moy's uh, very, very long essay, What is a Woman? Um, she comes up with this, I think, really important um, and thought-provoking observation that in most languages that she's aware of, we don't have the word gender. It's always a loan word. So in Russian, you have the word pol, which means sex. But when they say gender, they say gender. Uh, in Norwegian, there's no word for uh, gender. They use the English word. In Dutch, it's geslacht, which means sex, not gender. Um, so many languages don't have this gender-sex split. And this is, I think, a prime example why when we say queer or gender or uh, even the term sexuality, is there a concept? Like we, we argue about, is there this thing called music that exists apart from the sensorium, the social, the movement. Is there this thing called sexuality? Suzanne Cusick's wonderful essay um, on a lesbian relationship with music. She, you know, decades old, but still so important. She said, what about thinking of music, not music and sex, but music as sex, where the two aren't necessarily different? And you might think, well, what do you mean it's not, it's the same thing? But both are embodied. Both deal with relationships to other people, to other, to sonorities. And so I totally agree with what you're saying, that this use of English limits. You know, there was an article many, many years ago about the phenomenal rate of extinction of languages. I mean, there's something like literally thousands a day or something outrageous. And, and when languages die, it's, it's not just like, you know, oh, we need to save this, like, we need to save this artifact because it's beautiful. You know, what are languages? Languages are ways of making sense of this concept, this complex ecosystem, this concept, complex cosmology in which we work that we, none of us really understand. And when you lose a, lose a language, you lose alternate ways of conceptualizing, of relating to things. And even I would say, this goes back to my idea of, of thinking about things materially. When we lose the idea of hearing a language, of hearing a word, of being with a word, of watching someone's lips, or, or seeing how the word is formed, I really believe these aren't epiphenomenal things, that watching some, I used to joke with my ex husband, I don't know, we were never married, but we lived together, and he was uh, Russian from Uzbekistan, and 
you know, we would speak Russian sometimes and we would sometimes speak English. And I would say to him as a joke, you know, oh, we're going to speak Russian. I have to get my, my Russian face on. No, 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 no. And because really Russians, when they, you know, when you speak Russian language, it's, mm, you know, but I would say as opposed to my English face, like, how you doing? You know, sort of open and, and, but it's true. I mean, there's different postures. There's different ways of moving the face, you know, all of these things that are part of it and that we miss when we, when we lose all of these things, when we lose face-to-face -face contact, we, we lose conversation. So I think language is important. I think these, I would love to learn more about ICTM and these, uh, these, what did you call them? Dialogues, yeah, because I think we need more of that. Yeah. Hi, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I guess just to bookend the question about dyke anger, um, because my research is very focused on femininity and um, femmes and community care and softness. Mm. Um, and so I'm wondering what what your perspective is on the way that that directly challenges the masculinizing of academia by demanding care and softness as a part of the research, both at the application site and the writing. And I think actually, um, oh God, I was gonna say something and then just went right out of my head. Um, there was recently, um, two things, two conferences. It was a conference about care in academia, and uh, I didn't get to go to it. Um, I forget what the actual, top, the actual title was, but it was about care and generosity, yes. Um, and uh, there was also this really disturbing, um, really interesting, but disturbing conference about AI and empathy. And can AI be empathic and teaching AI to be therapists. And actually, this is happening in a way, um, when I was dealing with some issues, I'm going off on a tangent now, uh, uh, when I was dealing with some issues that I was thinking, I need to go to therapy, and realizing I couldn't afford it, and looking online, affordable therapy, there's all these things a therapy you can go to where you can get text messages from your therapist like you know you go girl and uh, <laughs> you know that kind of thing and it really sort of thinks it, it makes me sort of think of this haves and have nots you know you can have a real therapist and you can't yeah. but uh, getting back to your question um, yeah I think these things are so important and I want to make really really clear and, and this, this is not this is clear when I talk about masculinity it can be owned by anyone, by people who have male bodies, non-binary bodies, female bodies. Uh, it can be people who are white, black, any sort of racial identification or ethnic identification. It's sort of like, you know, when, when uh, uh, Jacques Lacan was constantly saying, no, the phallus is not the penis, it's, it's, it's something different. And I think it was Jane Flax who says, well, if it's not the penis, why don't we call it the, the toaster and not the phallus? <laughs> but I really do believe masculinity is embraced by so many, by, by most of us. So how do we get to value softness, care, generosity? Um, I will note that I was leading a conference and we all were, we were all supposed to read certain articles and discuss them. And one of them was so dense and so impenetrable, and it was like, you know, it was like an in-joke. Like, like only people who knew could read my article. And I said that I was sick of this, that I only wanted to read generous authors, authors who want to talk to me. So I think it can happen at the level of writing about generosity, writing about, I love this idea of softness. I mean, because this is so rich. I mean, even when you say the word, I feel, yeah. I feel it. Go, go. Oh, oh, I was also just, because you work with Russians, want to plug the book Red Love, um, all about Alexander Kolontai. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harry, Harry knows, I, I'm obsessed with this book. 
um, I, all she was a Bolshevik yeah. um, theorist. Amazing, beautiful femme writing. Very, very sensorial. And Stalin did Stalin stuff. And do you know all of coming from French feminism, this idea mm -hmm. of uh, feminine writing, which got a lot of pushback because it's um, supposedly essentialized, but I don't think any of those theorists literally thought about that this was only a subject position of the female body. And this is what also what Toiril Moy talks about. You know, woman is something very complex. But how do we start to value these things? Well, again, as I talked to Bev, I'm sorry, I'm repeating everything I talked to you about lunch today, but at lunch today, but you know, Catherine Lutz wrote about the masculinization of theory. I think this article, this chapter was from 1995, and then I came upon someone writing online about a, a recent um, anthropological conference where she said everything that Catherine Lutz wrote is exactly the same today. I think it comes from what I'm hoping this will encourage, where it comes from other ways of writing, where it comes from other ways of, where it comes from valuing other things. So I think it can be a mode of writing. I think it could be a subject of writing. For example, you might write about softness using some of this masculine armature of citing people. But you know, things can happen sort of, again, like, like sexuality, like identity, like uh, all of these things that we inhabit uh, on a continuum. And things can happen gradually where suddenly you sort of see more writing that appears to abjure that says I'm not playing by these rules anymore. Um, I, for Harry's course, um, I, I've given a bibliography of things for them to read and I'm so happy that the bibliographies for at least some of these writings are not the usual suspects that they are people whose voices aren't always heard. So I, I really do think that even just being here a couple days and speaking with some of you and, and again sort of feeling the good vibe here at MUN, um, I'm hopeful that younger people will be, you know, the torchbearers of things that are much different, much more generous, much more sustainable, much more hopeful. And I, you know, hearing your questions and seeing your faces and hearing your voices does make me have hope. But I do think the best hope that we have is to move away from this concept of discipline because it's, it's not accidental that it means, you know, many different things, one of which means stay in line. Um, yeah, so did that... Yeah, that was great. Okay, all right, thanks.